<laughs> Good evening, as this will be um, first presented to everyone who is joining us from the various places that will be joining us. Um, welcome to this program. We are delighted to be hosting. Um, we being Elliott Bay Book Company, which is on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle in the northwestern part of the US. Um, we are doing this program with um, extraordinary novelist Sanjeev Sahota for his uh, newly published book, China Room, a newly published novel uh, that's just come out in the US. And this reading and conversation, uh, which he will be doing with uh, Kamala Shamsi, who is one of our favorite writers, um, both of them joining us from far distances from Seattle. Um, Sanjeev is in Sheffield, England, and Kamala is with us from Karachi uh, in Pakistan. Um, clearly time zones away from here. So this program is being recorded both for because of time schedules and other considerations. Uh, so it will be coming to you um, that way. Nevertheless, even though it won't allow for sort of live questions to come in, I think you're in for a treat hearing um, this powerful new book um, read from and discussed and um, with two delightful, extraordinary writers um, doing so. Uh, China Room is Sanjeev Sahota's third novel uh, following uh, his debut, Ours Are the Streets, and then uh, the novel, The Year of the Runaways, which uh, attracted huge uh, readership and much critical acclaim. It was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize, for the Dylan Thomas Prize, and had, you know, it's still um, uh, ongoing readership here um, in Seattle and elsewhere um, around the world. Uh, the new book, China Room, which they will be talking about, um, I won't say too much, but it's a beautiful, powerfully, quietly powerful book um, set with two parallel but linked stories, uh, uh, one in, in rural village Punjab and uh, in, in the earlier in the 20th century, and then um, a, a, a linked but parallel story um, taking place in London uh, 70 years later. And... Um, this uh, Sanjeev and uh, Kamala will, will draw out um, in various ways. Kamala Shamsi, um, whom, um, let me back up here, say uh, Sanjeev has not been to Seattle. And we hope uh, when travels allow again, and if he's willing and uh, wanting to, um, I hope, hope that um, his coming this way would, would be happen. There's a, been a real readership for him. And there is that part where when we actually get a chance to be in the same place, um, there's kind of that wonderful energy there. Kamala Shamsi, I was going to say, we ha Kamala, we have seen here in Seattle, and uh, I've also had the good fortune of seeing her um, at festivals in places such as Jaipur and Sharjah, and I think we've had a, even a London sighting or two uh, along the way, so it's good to see her as part of this. Um, they, uh, I don't think, is, is, as all of this is part of happening during our pandemic time, um, you know, they're of their own friendship, and uh, but they haven't seen each other either in the last um, year and such. So um, this has sort of been their little, they're kind of getting getting to see each other that way as well. So with that, um, I will shortly disappear. I'll come back at the end. And um, you are in the great and capable hands of Sanjeev Sahota and Kamala Shamsi. Please now welcome them. And thank you both um, very much for doing this. Thank you, Rick. Um, and it is a pleasure to be at Elliott Bay, which is one of my favorite bookstores. And Sunny, when you go there, it'll become one of your favorite bookstores as well. Um, oh, I, I, just wish, I wish we could do this in person there. Um, and it's great to see you after all this. And you, Carla. Yeah, it's been way too long. And um, yeah, I hope we can do it over a table and in person soon as well. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, but of course, the nice thing about doing it this way is that, that readers can watch it from all over the place and in, in different times. So. Um, to all of you who are watching, wherever you are and whenever you are, welcome to this conversation. Um, Sunny, you know, I've loved all your works in China Room. It's such, a, such an amazing book. Um, and there's so much in it that I admire and I'm envious of in the most friendly kind of way. Um, but just to start us off, I think for, I, I think some of the people joining us will have read it already and, and some won't. Um, for those who haven't, can you just tell us what the title refers to? What is China Room? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, the book is about um, a place, um, a room, the China Room 
on a farm in India and about the, the two young lives that both inhabit that room and are also inhabited by it, I'd say. So we have, um, in 1929 at least, we have Meher, a, a young new bride who's arrived in um, the China room um, and her life is entirely um, controlled. She's not aware of who it is that she's been married to. Um, and she spends most of her, her hours working on the farm, sequestered away in the China room, um, veiled when she's not in the China room. And so for her, the China room is a place she wants to, to flee. So though I suppose that strand of the narrative is about her, yes, wishing to identify um, who her husband is, but I think more than that, it's about her trying to come to come to the realization that she has every right to to justice and to feel desire and every right to a sense of her own being as as anyone else. Um, and then seventy years later, we meet her uh, her great grandson, who arrives on the farm and in the china room kind of um, where he's arrived to come to terms and process his own pain and, and his past. And so whereas for Meher in 1929, the China Room represents a place she wants to flee, it represents a subjugation for her great grandson who arrives, it's, it offers a sanctuary. Um, so I think for both these lives um, and in both these strands of the novel, which take place over, over two summers, in fact, the whole novel takes place across three summers. It's it's a summer of it's a summer of reckoning. It's a summer of trying to forge their own path. And the title "China Room" both refers to the place, but also it refers to what's happening outside of the China Room, the subjugation and the oppression that that it that it represents for for many of the characters. Um, when you say that she. You know, you sort of hinted in this interesting way at the fact that she doesn't know who she's married to. And in fact, it's mm. it's an astonishing setup because there are these three women who sleep together in the China room most of the time, and they're married to three brothers, but they because they only essentially come to the men uncovered in the darkness at night, they don't know which of the three brothers they're married to. So there is this thing where each of them is looking at the three brothers and and um, trying to work out who is who, which is just really a remarkable dramatic setup. Um, but, you know, I'm going to start with something, Sunny, which shouldn't be a cause for any comment, but but is, unfortunately, which is the fact that actually we don't get, I mean, it, it still is weirdly a surprise to have a male writer writing a book which has women so much at its heart um, and the experience of women and the consciousness of um, women, women it's, it's so powerfully attends to their interior lives. Um, and there are a number of women in there who are very interesting, but I, I wanted particularly to talk to you about Mai, who is Meher's mother-in-law, um, because she's one of those characters who could really easily have been just a complete monster. And she's not. And I wondered if you could talk to me about her and how you saw her and how she came to you as a character. Yeah, um, I think she she does monstrous things. I think with, without hopefully being a monster herself, and she's a really I find just kind of like fascinating. She's this there's this kind of this Madame Merlishness about her in the way her kind of her sinewy kind of like um, deceits and the kind of the the way she controls the entire house. So um, I do see her as. Um, a victim of of sorts, actually, because I think she was she was, I and mean, this is hinted at in the in the novel. She was also a new bride at one point. The china room is called the china room because of the willow pattern plates that sit on a high shelf, which came as part of Mai's dowry when she was a new bride. And and it's I think it's made clear in the novel that she's also been the victim of this brutal patriarchal society. Um, she's been the victim of the men in her life. Um, the various things are kind of like alluded to in in the novel. Um, but whereas, you know, unlike Mayer, who who is also a victim, or at least starts off with a bitch, Mayer tries to escape that. 
for my the way she's dealt with it is by internalizing that misogyny and and then in turn lashing it out onto the other women who who arrive across her path i find her i think i was watching um an adaptation of of hamlet not long ago and it just struck me that there are and maybe it was there in my subconscious gertrude hamlet's mother and my there's something about the way gertrude doesn't mourn for her her dead husband in the way that my doesn't either and something about the the way Hamlet can't handle the, his mother's sexuality. And I think there's something around my and her sexuality. Obviously, she manhandles the women frequently, but also the way her touch lingers over her sons. It's quite at one point she puts her, you know, her, her hand onto her on her son's face in in a in, in an intimate and slightly disturbing encounter. So there is something around sons not being able to deal with their mother's sexuality, which is also going on in this in this farm. Um, but I do see her as 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 another victim along along with Meher, and also there's the aunt and Radka, and there's all these women across these hundred years of time. And it's interesting to me how they, how each of the women, is kind of a um, is how they, each of the women's narrative is kind of like um, represents a different. A point along this kind of like trajectory that Meher is trying to get to, this kind of Meher, with Meher trying to become free. So you could say she starts off in a kind of like a my kind of place, but ends up in a kind of like, or tries to end up in Neradika kind of Neradika kind of place. Neradika is a doctor in the in the contemporary strand of the novel, and and I wanted each of the four women, the four main women in the novel, to kind of like have this without them becoming symbols or becoming representative, and you want them to be real and felt and vivacious in their own right. But also to trace this this kind of arc over over this hundred years. Mm. Um, you mentioned that with with Mai, there, there's sort of hints of the life she had before and the story she had before. Um, and one of the things, I and mean, I mentioned that I'm at some points envious of this book. And one of the things I was envious of is the the very controlled way in which you uh, control isn't the right word, the very successful way in which you give us hints of a life. Um, and sometimes, you know, you'll give us a character. So Meher early on, she's very close to a cousin who's really like a brother to her. And we see that relationship and I think, oh, this is going to be a central re relationship. And then she gets married and goes away and we just get this line telling us he never sees her again and we never hear from him again. Um, and of course, that is how stories play out in, in life is that there is so much that remains unknown, people disappear. There are things you guess at or are hinted at, but you never know the true story of them. Um, and I wonder whether you think that fiction is a place where we contend with the unknowable because there's so much that's unknowable going on in here. Um, I do, I do think, I mean, it's I guess I don't think that we know we know anyone really. Well, sometimes I mean it's a cliche to say we're strangers to ourselves, but it's I, think, I do think that's quite often true. But also the people that we're closest to, you know, the you know your you know your parents, your children, you know your, you know your partner, the person you share your bed with. Fundamentally, I think these people are strangers to us. Everyone at, at kind of a some deep essential level is is unknowable. And I think fiction should suggest that I think it's a light when we see novels where everything is known about a character and everything is sort of laid bare for them. I like novels where I try to write characters where there's a sense that the characters too have their own secrets and fantasies which are which can be guessed at as you say but they're not they're not known that feels entirely entirely true true to life for me and I wanted those gaps or I wanted the reader to do that work of inference in this mm in this book, partly because actually the, the novel is concerned with ideas of authorship and who is telling the story um, of this, of this, um, of Meher, and who has the right to tell the story and, and what does, what do those questions of authorship do to, do to a piece of, to a piece of fiction? Because I think there is an idea that the, the novel is being narrated by or it suggested it could be being narrated by the unnamed or the narrator who's only given the initial S on the contemporary strand. And that felt quite important for me to have that in because I was wrestling with fictionalizing 
what is a story loosely based on a piece of family legend about my own great grandmother and I was thinking quite hard about why should I tell it or should I fictionalize it you know tell the story of this of this woman who has no right of reply is it okay for me to attribute you know behaviors to her and words into her mouth when she has no 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 say in return and the way I kind of reconciled myself to it was by kind of thinking well if not me then who you know and does it have to be an imposition does it have to be me imposing my voice onto it can it not be an act of love from me to this ancestor of mine can I not see it in those terms does it have to be about appropriation and once but, I, but once I started to think of it in those terms then um, the whole thing seemed to flow more freely but it was important for me to have that question of authorship lingering over the entire novel it's why the mehestrans are written in these very kind of in a very constructed way compared to the 99 strand which is the first person kind of narrative mehestrand are in 40 you know, um quite constructed um segments 40 being the age of the narrator when he's at the time of writing it as well um so i think there are hints at actually of all these questions Walter, which points to these questions of what's knowable, what's knowable, and what's unknowable in the text and in life. Um, I don't normally, while speaking to an, an author, go right to the final page of their book, because generally that's a spoiler. But but for anyone who's read this book, it, it is remarkable. You read the whole thing and you come to the final page. I'm going to try and hold that up. Mm. And there's this photograph. Um, can you tell us something about this photograph? Yeah, sure. That's a photograph of my great grandmother holding me when I was um, probably a little over a month old in 1981. And she'd come over from um, India, from her village in India for the first time um, in her life. And she'd come to England to meet me, her, um, her great, her first great um, grandson. And she died a few months after that. Um, photo was taken she died when she went back to India and she died um, there and that photo was always going to be at the end of the book I toyed at one point I, I think I just doubted myself and thought should it be should it not be there or should it be somewhere inside the book but in the end I thought no the end is the place where it needed to be um, but I guess for two reasons firstly because I think it it kind of pulls hopefully it clarifies in the reader's mind various questions that they might have been thinking about, about who is this story about and how autofictional is the is the 99 strand. I think it just pulls those strings quite tight in the in the reader at the end. Um, but also because these two strands um, they do kind of spiral around each other. I did see from the beginning of the novel as this kind of this this spiral structure. So we have quite longish sections in each from the 1929 strand and from the 1999 strand then as the book goes on these sections the intercutting gets quicker and quicker um, it's just like a spiral and things winding up until with the with the photo at the end where it kind of just knots together and i wanted the the, the photo to do that that formal structural work as well as the hopefully the emotional work as well of of kind of showing what it does it's it's so successful because we spend quite a long time the Meher story, and I think that's the book that this is a book set in 1929, and and which I'm very happy to go along with. And then this other voice comes in, um, and of course your first question is how do these things work together, these two voices? But it it is you know as it, it's such a powerful effect these sort of longer sections, and then when you're just moving between one and the other, and there are all these. It's not overdone at all, but there are all these echoes going back and forth between the, the present and the past section um, in the most interesting kinds of ways. Um, and I did wonder at what point you figured out the structure. Was it always, I mean, did it start with you looking at this picture and thinking, maybe I can tell her story, but how do I do? I mean, at what point did, did you realize, A, that you'd have two storylines and then the spiral structure? Quite late on, quite late on. I was writing for several years, kind of just writing in the dark, trying to figure out what the story was. So initially I started off thinking I was going to write a, a long piece of historical fiction, starting off with this, this amazing setup of these three um, brides who didn't know who their um, husbands were. 
and along that just seemed like quite a something just quite mythic about that just idea of of of, of that setup and i was alongside that i was having this idea of these doppelgangers this quite surreal kind of like to kind of play on that mythic kind of start having this surreal idea of doppelgangers being in the narrative as well and i wrote about maybe 15 20 000 words of that back in 2016 and then the novel just kind of as, ho as often happens with me and first drafts it just fell apart and i was just starting to question like why do why does why does this story need to be written? Why do I need to write this story about um, essentially a story about partition and immigration and, and this long historical kind of fiction? Um, and I decided that that's uh, that doesn't need to be. It, didn't, it seemed to lose its lose its vitality, lose urgency. So I set it aside, and then spent the next kind of two years or so, three years, kind of thinking I wasn't going to write that novel and working on this other novel, which strangely was set in the future and involved a contagion, oddly enough. And then, um, and that novel had a kind of like a, this doppelganger motif running through it as well, but slowly to try to try make that novel come alive, the doppelganger started looking like a, um, a version of me. So in effect, I kind of became the doppelganger in that story. But again, it wasn't quite working either. And then, in spring of 2019, I my father had some surgery, and this is in this is in um, the book in in China Room. And I went back to lend my father and my mum a hand, and and I went back to live in the house and above the shop I grew up in. And then, and for the first time since I left, pretty much when I was in my late teens, and there was a wall that photo and was on was on the wall. And I think just quite quickly over a matter of a few days in the first week or two of, of being back home, I guess if it was quite triggering, it just, you know, that sense of just the past and all sorts of pasts rushing up at you. And, and as happens in the book, I started, I opened up the laptop and I started just seeing that actually had, that story that I'd set aside three years or two years earlier, three or two, three, about um, this young bride, that is actually talking to this other story I, I've been trying to write about this version of version of me and this this kind of doppelganger motif. And once I saw that, and I saw how they could be kind of put together, then the novel came quite quickly um, from that point. But I don't think it would have come quite quickly had those previous years not not happened. I think they needed to happen in order for me to arrive at a point where you can see what when the book's telling you this is or the, you know some the narrative saying this is what the story is it, it seemed to I, I seemed only be able to be able to see it because of that the work i'd done before, beforehand I, I say sometimes it was a bit like I, I spent four years walking in a darkened forest just trying to like retracing my steps going on the same path finding new paths until finally just searching for the clearing where the revelation would kind of happen and it felt like the revelation happened back in my old house staring at this photo of my yeah. of my great grandmother. Mm. Um, that original version you'd written, or the earlier version, was that also as wonderfully spare in the writing? Because you know this is a story, a novel that could have been twice its length. And the year of Runaways was you know it was a big book. Um, yeah. Was, yeah. Was this always going to be? Because I mean there is sort of partition and all of that and the independence movement and, and things that are going on in the background and, and they're very much present but they are um, a backdrop and you know I can easily see how some other version of it might have made that a bigger thing. Yeah I, um, yeah you're right the, the independence movement is there in the background and the way I wanted to use that was to show actually how the on the farm or the it's kind of a microcosm of what's going on in the larger political movements, or the, or the mistrust, or the looking over your shoulder, or the deception, it's all kind of there on the farm. As you know, and the idea that politics doesn't stay outside; it enters your, enters your courtyard, it enters your bedroom, it enters all, all, the, all your personal intimate spaces. Um, but that earlier novel, it was, it probably wasn't as, as, written in, in quite a sparer way. Though that does seem to be my. Certainly, that's the kind of writing I respond to, and it's the kind of writing I 
aspire to write this kind of this hard, uh, terse lyricism. I guess it's it's what um, I'm not a I'm not a splashy writer. I just I, I I don't like to spill a drop. I just which I think can be quite infuriating because at the end of it, I'm forever seem to be just playing around with commas and it infuriates me. But that's that's I just that's what I have to do. Um, but certainly spareness, and I think that spareness was. It was there in Runaways and in Owls Other Streets, um, but they in, in Runaways in particular was trying to contend with a more sprawling narrative. Here there's a distillation, I think, which um, which really speaks to yeah, the kind of writer I really want to be. Mm. Um, you said that when you went back to your parents' house and there was a the photograph on the wall, um, you said it was sort of triggering in a way. And I've, I've read in other places, you talk a little about intergenerational trauma you talk about that and how that is part of what you were working with within the novel? Yeah, um, I suppose when I talk about intergenerational trauma, it's how it doesn't, I suppose the idea that I don't actually believe that redemption is always possible or that pain and trauma can always be got over, um, which isn't a new observation, it's, 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 it's often been made there's a line in the book towards the end where the narrator or the young man the unnamed narrator says um, um the underlying hurt does not go away and can only be paid attention to mm. which i think is getting at this idea that um quite often times it's it's the best thing the only thing you can do is kind of um accept your pain which doesn't mean that the pain is acceptable but it means that you have to learn to live around it somehow and, and and move on while keeping that that pain kind of still still there and i think for the narrator that trauma is it's so there's the trauma for for meher um which is to obviously to do with her her oppression the society she lives in the, the vicious way she's um controlled by her, not her mother-in-law and and the men around her and by society, the way they use gossip as a kind of a currency to kind of keep women in their place as well. Um, and then that lives on inside her, or it's it's kind of passed down to her great grandson who lives in the north of England, in the deindustrialized um, north of England, where he's, he's and his family kind of suffer from you know, various kinds of um, racism various and and i think that that kind of suffering is um it kind of leads the narrator towards um well he i don't think he can quite really make sense of he's he's 18 it's me i don't think he can quite make sense of well, he can't quite grab hold of that kind of pain and the way he tries to see that pain is by he turns to addiction he turns to drugs and I think the reason why he does turn to drug is it, it's, a, it's a tangible form of pain. He kind of, it's in that vial or in that syringe, he kind of houses his pain. So that's it, like he can put a face to it, he can put a name to it, he can put a, an image to it. And I think for him, that's what his addiction is. Oh, and addiction for, I think many people is a way to try to manage kind of thwarted desire. And I think it's very much like that for, for this, um, for this, for the, for the narrator in the novel. Mm. Um, I'm sort of interested in things that, because I've I've read all your works, any things that I see as sort of connective tissue, um, and I mean the obvious one, of course, is sort of first and second gen generation immigrants and um, the idea of belonging, which is a, a double-sided thing. It's on one hand, it's the sense of do I belong, and on the other side, it's a sense of other people looking at you and saying you don't belong. Um, and how these things work together. And there's there's a line where the narrator is looking at his father who's in despair and, and he has this line, did he worry that our lives here would always be seen as fundamentally illegitimate? Um, and I read an interview with you where someone, you know, brings up something to do with race and how you write about race and, and, and you make the point that you write about class and this is never talked about. Um, can you talk about the ways now in which the subject matter you deal with shouldn't only be seen as one of race, but also of class, because there's a weird way in which class, which is that huge structural imbalance, just sort of seems to disappear from many conversations around um, 
things like racism and inequality. Yeah, it's not it's not spoken about at all, and I have said, and I do think that class has had a bigger impact on my life than, than race. Race has had a, a, a you know a significant impact as well, but it always felt to me growing up that I was fact um class was a thing that was really holding kind of holding me holding me down race actually was the thing that I could almost turn to as a kind of like a as a sucker almost or as, you know as a, as a place of solace that it's almost like if people are against me it's because of it's because of this thing that you know is is it's kind of out of my control it's it's race you know and it, it made it sort of made any kind of suffering easier to, to deal with class is just and it just feels seems quite clear to me that by not talking about class, by not talking about class-based disaffection, it allows kind of more nefarious agents to step into that space mm -hmm. and shape that kind of that class disaffection to, you know, in, in a quite mendacious and and um, malign way. So, for for example, we. Um, I suppose what I'm saying is that um, that when we talk about the politics of identity, it tends to be spoken about through the lens of ra either race, gender, or sexuality. Class never really gets gets mentioned. Class class gets forgotten. It's forgotten by the left largely. Um, you know, and various things have happened which have meant that class is not um, really given. Or class working working class voices aren't given kind of enough airtime. Austerity, the dwindling of the trade unions, the kind of this readjustment of social democratic parties. It's all left the working class in in a kind of a voiceless voiceless place. And because the left haven't really um, kind of um, looked after it or stepped in, and I'm, I'm very much of the left, in case there was any doubt. Um, the right, the racist right, has. And so we end up in a situation where people, working class people of all races, are pitted against each other. So you end up hearing conversations when white working class boys are said to not achieve well at school because of black or brown working class boys. Whereas actually, if you look at, if you look at the numbers, you know, white working class boys and black working class boys do do equally well or equally poorly. The difference is between people in the middle class and the upper middle class first and, and people in the working. That's the that's the gap we should be actually be measuring. Or people say that if working class of um, you know people can't get housing, that's apparently the fault of um, immigrants or asylum seekers. When actually no, if there's no housing, it's because the ruling classes haven't built any social housing since the 1980s. And that's never actually Discussed. And so the way the right have actually played it is by pitting people um, of different races in the working class against each other. And that feels to me entirely, well, it's going to hinder any kind of like building of the structures of resistance which we need to build if actually working class forces are going to have, have a voice and be able to actually see their lives um, see their lives improved upon. Yeah. Do you think literary fiction is being enough attention to all that? Oh, no, of course not. Of course not. Literary fiction is <laughs> no. I mean, there's no reason why literary fiction is a, is, is a special case. You know, it's, it, it's kind of, it's, you know, books are published in a cultural moment and whatever's happening out there in the culture, literary fiction, fiction will reflect that we have this idea that fiction should be at the vanguard of change. And, and sometimes it is. Uh, absolutely, we can look at you know, Lady Chatterley's Lover and Times, you know, books like that, there are times when literary fiction really does step in and, and cause a change. Um, but there is there is a, I think, um, a hesitancy, or perhaps they just don't know or, or realise well, that, um, that this needs to be, I guess, as I say, the focus tends to be around issues of rightly, and I think, actually, I think in the 70s, when we look at how racist, how sexist and how homophobic um, our society was in the 70s, there absolutely needed to be a focus on those issues and we needed to have that politics of, ident that politics of identity to really um, put these issues front and centre and deal with them. Um, but in the meantime, class, um, which, can only, which 
relies on kind of a politics of solidarity and there's a question of whether you can have a politics of solidarity and a politics of politics of identity side by side i don't know that you can but class which very much relies on a politics of solidarity kind of just got got left by the wayside and my feeling is if we're going to really get a handle on this i think we it, it, it will require a real return to this politics of universalism this politics of solidarity and and races of all uh, I mean, all races in the working class coming together rather than being pitted against each other. It's really odd that we, and by actually by, it's really odd that we talk about a white working class. That class has been racialized in that, in that way, in that the right has done that and the left has allowed that to happen as if there's no such thing as a brown working class or a black working class. That I, the only identity I'm seen to be allowed to be have is the identity of a brown person. I can't, you know, but to say I'm also a working class where I was well, I was working class. It's kind of hard to argue on working class now, perhaps. But I was working class. Is yeah. yeah, that seems identity that I'm not allowed to actually have because working class has become a white working class thing. And I think one thing that the book does so successfully is it really weaves together in in that way the best weaving that you don't know doing it until you stand back. Um, that there's gender and there's class and there's race all going on in, in mm. different ways into different degrees. Um, and, you know, as I said, with all your work, there is that question of belonging again around first and second generation immigrants. One of the things that I find so interesting in this novel is that we also have that sense of wanting to belong and not belonging in Meher. Um, mm -hmm. Who has gone through what you know? What people don't think of as migrations, but they are. She's migrated from one family to another, from one part of India to another. She's migrated from childhood to being a wife. And I wondered whether there was a part of you that also want to disrupt this idea that belonging and not belonging are really words that you attach to migrants and rather than anything else. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. She's searching for home as well. She's searching for. Connection. She says at one point towards the end of, of the novel, like all she wants is her own house yarded with a square of neem trees. That's kind of all she's, that's part of the reason why she too mm. is escaping the yeah. China room um, with Suraj. And even her love for Suraj, you could say is, I mean, it's a, it's a question mark about how much does she really love for Suraj or how much, how much is her love for Suraj a projection of her desire for a home and for freedom. Mm. So you're right, these apps, these ideas of, belonging of searching for a home um, aren't aren't particular to migrants or any one group of people, but anyone can feel um, any, yeah, anyone can feel um, as if they don't belong. And sometimes I do wonder if being able to belong or is also a point of privilege, are only the privileged allowed to allow to belong. You look at the treatment of um, Dalits, in, in India, how, how wonder sometimes how, how much do, do they feel that they belong in India? How much are they allowed to belong in India? So it absolutely isn't a, a migrant, non-migrant issue at all. Mm. Um, it's interesting you mention her and Suraj, and we're not going to give away a lot in plot, but um, because I've read this a couple of times, I do go back and forth and thinking, you know, is this romantic, anti-romantic? It's so interesting the way you, different ways in which you can read that. I mean, those, those um, central relations, but also, what I love, and this was even stronger to me in the second time, is actually the relationship that I find I'm really interested in is um, between Meher and Gurleen, who is the wife of one of the other brothers, um, and who is with her, you know, in that China room. Um, and that those relationship between what it is, you know, and, and you you talk about this a little bit with Mai, and, and it's to do with the structures of power, really. I mean, you you talk about it specifically around my and gender, but anything in the structures of power of how, if you are the ones who are being oppressed, do you do you turn against each other or is there solidarity? And the way that that comes out through the women in, in the China room, I think is really beautifully and expertly done. Yeah, I really wanted that sense of those being, it was tricky because three is an awkward number. How do you have three? And the book is actually littered with triangles um, and threes and triples. It's one of the ways in which the book, the structure of the book kind of grounds itself. But yeah, I wanted those, I wanted the three women to be, um, I mean, different, but also just quite, quite tight and quite close. They're in this, they're in this awful, precarious situation together and they do lean on each other for support and they do, 
you know, have great deal, a great deal of affection for each other, as different as they as they might be, and as much as they might sort of um, envy one another as well. And throughout, as the novel goes on, I wanted um, that really that kind of the relationship, the bonds between us, to be really put under strain, and actually to put their loyalty to each other. Yeah. Um, um, loyalty is too too strong a word. To put their feelings for each other to you know, to the real test, and as things as you know go out of control or as mayor and as mayor sort of can't really see what's happening and the other sisters can how much do they owe mayor how, you know they could have stepped in and told her what was happening but they don't because they need to protect themselves as well so there's power relations as i say absolutely you know in, in fact every corner of of the china room and of their relationship mm. um i wanted to just take you a little sideways because um, there are references in here to to books and art and, and things like that, and and I want to talk to you about a couple of artists or pieces of art that I know have been significant to you. Um, tell me about Musée de Beaux Art. Why is that? Why is that something you keep going back to? Oh uh, yeah, you, you you probably spotted the the reference to it in in the book that the planes are, are sailing and they don't collide. It's yeah. a novel that I am sorry. It's a poem that. Um, yeah, I just, I suppose it's those, I mean, the whole poem, but, you know, about suffering, they were never wrong. The old masters, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place, et cetera, et cetera. And um, um, it's probably the poem, one of the first poems I learned off by heart. And that, I suppose, that always carries a special place when you feel like it's something you can just carry in your head and wherever you are, you can just start. It's always just, turn, you, can, you can just turn it over in your mind. And I suppose because it is about suffering and how we, how we deal with, Suffering, how we allow suffering to take place while the world continues, as the world must continue, continue around us. Because I do think, as much as all my novels are about belonging and unbelonging, they're also about suffering, actually. And if if ours are the streets, it's about the suffering of an individual. The Year of the Noise is about um, the suffering of a group of people, and China Room is about suffering across time. Mm. I realise I've just started my, I was trying to start my next novel and. Again, it's the same thing, you know, suffering as our condition kind of keeps keeps turning up. So it's a suffering and transcendence, because there's there's this transcendence in runaways, there's mem and in ours other streets, when he's on that cliff and, and in China as well. Suffering and transcendence somehow seem to be quite important to me. I don't know. So I sometimes wonder if there's a Catholic thing, but I don't know. I'm not Catholic, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think belonging is possible? Because there's so much yearning for belonging and striving for belonging. Yeah. I don't know. I I went through stages when when I was younger, I really wanted to belong. When you know, when you're, I was, you know, that I was. I grew up in a very, in an area that was very white. And when you are, you know, different. Or I mean, young, you, know, you just want to fit in. You just want to belong, obviously, and. But then, as a and you know, in my twenties, I, I I thought I'd sort of accepted, or I told myself that you know you don't need to belong. It's better to be an outsider. It's much better to be, I thought, a writer. It's much better to have that kind of that that kind of perspective from um, the outsider perspective. Um, but I don't know. I think now I seem to be back to wanting, thinking belonging is actually really important because I think if, what does belonging to belong to a land, for example, what does it mean and to me it means that you're part of the story that a nation tells about itself mm. um, it's and if you feel at home in a land home is usually a place where you go to shelter for refuge you feel like you have a place where no matter what you you know they, you will take you in they they will take you in you know you will be that will be your home and we know that's that's not true we've seen how citizenship gets gets revoked how actually as much as things have developed in in terms of race relations you know massively in the last 50 years there's still a sense that it's still always contingent that actually your place in in this country is still always dependent on your your behavior which it isn't for people for other you know for for largely for white people in in the uk um so i think to not have to live in that sense of precariousness to feel like you have a shelter and a refuge it feels to me and that's and i think what if you have that belonging it must be just for those that have it, it must feel just quite grounding and centering as well. So, yeah, I do think it's 
it's in it's important but your question was is it possible and i think i have to believe that it is yeah yeah all right uh sunny before we we head off would you read from china room for us for a bit yeah. so we can hear it yeah i'd love to thank you uh, i'm just going to read from um from the beginning from two parts but i read continuously and i'll just cleverly allied a few pages but, um, so this is right from the beginning and no context is needed. Meher is not so obedient to 15 year old that she won't try to uncover which of the three brothers is her husband. Already the morning after the wedding and despite nervous trembling hands, she combines varying amounts of lemon, garlic and spice in their side plates of sliced onions and then attempts to detect the particular odor on the man who visits later that same night, invisible to her in the dark. It proves inconclusive, the strongest smell by far her fear. So she tries again after overhearing one of the trio complaining about the calluses on his hands. The concentration is fierce when the husband's palm next strokes her naked arm. But then too, she isn't certain. Maybe all male hands feel so rough, so clumsily eager and dry. It is 1929, summer is erupting and the brothers do not address her in one another's presence. Indeed, they barely speak to her at all. And she, it goes without saying, is expected to remain dutiful, veiled and silent like the other new brides. Spying from her window, she sees only the brother's likeness. Close in age, they share the same narrow build with unconvincing shoulders and grave eyes, serious faces that carry no slack, features that follow the same rules. The three are evenly bearded, the hair trimmed short and tight and all day they wear loose turbans cut from the same saffron wrap. Most hours the brothers will be out working the fields, playing, drinking, while she weaves and cooks and shovels and milks, until those evenings when Mai, their mother, says to her, raising a tea glass to grim lips, not the china room tonight. Later, her husband says, you're used to this life now. He strokes Meher's ankle bone with his thumb, back and forth, back and forth. It tickles and she wants to move her foot, but knows she mustn't. She can see nothing of him. When he stepped across the room and lifted his knee onto the bed, he moved through blackness. Still, he strokes her ankle bone. It's as if he wants to say something, or perhaps she's the one who should be doing the saying. No, no, you'll know when to open your mouth. We went to see priests, Ah, uh, children, pearls. I need to buy pearls. If you keep them under the bed, you will swell, glow, a boy. Yes, she says after a moment. She thinks she hears him nod or sigh. And before he departs, he closes his hand around her entire ankle and presses. Alone, Mahal exhales with relief, rising in the same breath and reties her hair into the nape of her neck. Children, she thinks, and sits very still in the dark to discover what she really feels about the prospect. On the one hand, the sooner sons arrive, the sooner her presence in the house is secure. Not everyone is as forgiving as her father, willing to overlook a wife who can't birth males, refusing to switch her for another who can. But then again, once her child comes, her few moments of peace will be gone. At least now, when Mai's out, she and her bants can steal across the yard for a nap in the shade. What hope for that when her son is latched to her breast? Mer hand, Mer's hand goes to her neck, protectively, as if only now appreciating the luxury of being alone with herself. Another minute passes, two, until she knows she must go, and she drapes her chimney over her head, ready to yank down the veil should she need to. She opens the door, and the cool marble meets her feet, her feet, as she steps outside. She feels suddenly alive, enough to levitate into the night, and it is an immense effort to remain grounded here in this horseshoe of a yard with the three doors all opposite. Which did he enter, if any? Meher descends the two steps that take her beyond the overhang of the veranda and onto the outer yard, where she knows to duck for the bats flying overhead and to avoid the deep divot to her right 
walking the path between the washing line and the charpoys piled against the wind, piled against the wall. At the unmarbled entrance to the china room, she places her fingernails in the one spot where the door can be prized open and not make a sound. She does all this without pause or misstep, because in a purely practical sense, her husband is right. She is, she is already used to this life, to this small world of hers, which is, she is now saddened to recall, just what Monty said would happen. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Sally. And I think Rick is going to come back and see us off. Rick, Rick is coming in to see you off and to say thank you for that lovely reading and thank you both for this conversation, um, which has taken readers, both ones who have by now perhaps read this marvelous book, but also those who have yet to read it, um, through it very adroitly. So there's things that will be uh, familiar for those who have read, but also enticements for those who haven't. I, when, the one little comment I'll actually add to what you said, Sanjeev, about you were talking about the kind of euphemism, euphemistic use of working class um, over there. That's very apt over here where um, a number of commentators right and left who um, invoke the term working class are, are, are assuming it's working class is white and uh, which leaves usually mm -hmm. writers and commentators of color to say, well, our, our people are, there's all, most of us are working class and that use of that. So um, that would, you were using, using it there, but it also, I think readers here can, could, should and be, would be able to see that. Um, that's great. One thing I also want to add um, is more about Kamala because I was prattling on about places I've seen her. I left her own books out of the out of mention here um, because she's a terrific and wonderful novelist um, whose uh, most recent novel is Home Fire, but also uh, some others such as A God in Every Stone and um, Burnt Shadows and uh, more to come, I believe, from what what we're hearing. But uh, nothing nothing on the immediate horizon. But I want to say um, acknowledge that and say. Um, uh, as we do send everyone off um, uh, for here, um, that China Room is at Elliott Bay, as are uh, Sanjeev's other books, uh, as are Kamala's books. And um, uh, please visit us um, both by coming in. We're, we're actually, we're open uh, for walk-in business, but also virtually or by calling us up and, and getting these books. We do have signed book plates that um, have made their way over from uh, Sheffield to Seattle uh, that um, are in copies of, of China Room as well. So um, thank you for that. Thank you both um, uh, so much. And uh, I, I didn't realize uh, Kamala would be in uh, uh, Karachi when we were doing this, although I knew it's always a possibility. And it's uh, the time we're recording this, it's early evening, daylight still in Sheffield, but it's it's on into the night in Karachi. So um, thank you both. And um, we hope to see you um, in our with, within our doors at some point, or we'll come find you somewhere over there, um, you know, where, wherever you may be. We look forward to, to that. And um, say again, everyone, uh, thank you for attending to this. And um, you've got great, wonderful books um, to read. So thank you both uh, so much. Thank you. thank you, Rick, and thank you, Sunny. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, so, Kamala. Have we, have we stopped recording? Don't know. We're still well, we're still there, but we, we'll, we'll, she'll, I think she'll turn this off and maybe you can stay there. Yes. 